Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Chris Mullen, and I'm the executive director of the Workforce Institute at UKG. The Workforce Institute is a think tank that helps organizations drive performance by addressing the challenges that affect both hourly and sal salaried employees. Now, through education and research, we empower organizations with practical ideas for building a modern workforce. And as you know, as we all know, these last 18 months have been no shortage of challenges. Today, we're here to talk about a big one, a really big one. And it's one that's affecting about every business, regardless of your industry, the size of your segment, and or your, even your location. And that challenges the labor shortage. And one of my favorite parts of my job is traveling around the country, speaking at conferences and privately to organizations. And it doesn't matter where I am in the U.S., there are help wanted signs just everywhere you look, every corner, whether you're, you're in a, a card share, whether you're coming off of an airplane in the airport. And I bet many of you are struggling with both hiring and retention today too. By most estimates, there's more than about 10 million open jobs right now. Yet there's also millions of people who were working before the pandemic that remain out of work today. So what, what gives? What gives here? And you know what can organizations like yours be doing to be as competitive as possible? Well, to explore this topic, I'd like to welcome two members of the Workforce Institute's Advisory Board. First, I'd like to welcome John Fries. John, hey, can you welcome, and can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm John Fries, um, Senior Managing Director at Anchor. I run our global labor strategy practice. And I spend some of my time talking with Chris around the country at different conferences. Um, my job is exclusively to consult with companies that have large amounts of hourly employees. Uh, so the, the, we always say it's a labor participation shortage. There's lots of labor out there. It's just not showing up. Um, but that's been my primary focus. I've been doing this for about 25 years. Hey, thanks so much, John. I'm also excited that we're joined by another board member, Sarah Morgan. Uh, Sarah, you and I have not spoken together yet, but we, I think we have a half dozen things on the calendar for the rest of this yeah. year. So please tell me about it yourself. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm Sarah Morgan. I'm the Director of Equity and Inclusion for Human Reso, which is a human resources and people management consultancy. So I work with organizations to create workplaces where employees of all identities feel safe, seen, and supported. I've been in human resources as a practitioner now for over 20 years, um, starting out as a recruiting coordinator and leading the HR teams for national brands like Jiffy Lube, ADT Home Security, Taco Bell, just to name a few. Um, I've been a writer and a speaker at HR conferences nationally and internationally for over 10 years now. I've been featured in CNN, Fast Company, Essence Magazine, Black Enterprise. I have two podcasts, um, one called Leading in Color. And then I also host a monthly show through the HR Happy Hour Network called The Inclusion Crusade, where I talk about cultivating positive workplace cultures through inclusion, equity, and social consciousness. And when I'm not doing all that, I am a wife and a mom with a blended family of five children and two dogs um, living outside of Durham, North Carolina. So I'm glad to be with you all today. Wow. Yes, I know, right, John? We <laughs> thought our lives were crazy. Woo. I want to go again, by the way. I want to do my intro again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Sarah. And um, so as everyone who's attending this webinar, as you can see, we have some, some great experts here. Um, my background is in human resources, where I was a director for over 15 years. And now, uh, similar to John, I, I go around the country speaking and, um, and consulting with organizations. So before we really jump into this one, um, Sarah and John, I'm really curious to hear from the two of you on something that's been on my mind, and we know that there's a hiring challenge today. I, I mean, it's just so prevalent wherever you look, as I, as I talked about earlier. And we also know that there's a huge retention problem. That's where I'm spending a lot of my time speaking. Mm -hmm. um, but are these problems, so are these two things, are they weighted equally, like a 50-50 split? Is it 60-40 one way or the other? What do you think and why, and, and Sarah, I'll start with you on this one. 
I really feel like it's more of a 60-40 split. I don't feel like it's 50-50. I know we're going to talk more about like all of the hiring challenges that companies are having kind of as this conversation continues. So I don't want to go too deep into all the reasons why we're in kind of this crisis, but the difficulties that organizations have right now for finding talent for open positions is very real. Um, it's very challenging and it's very much not going anywhere. Um, and those difficulties are having a direct impact on companies' abilities to fill the demands of their business. And that's being felt across the world. And whether it's our, our favorite local place that can't open their dining room because they're not staffed, or whether it's a software company that can't launch a product because they don't have the developers to get it online as scheduled, or whether it's a local car dealership that just can't get vehicles into the country to be able to sell them for purchase. Like we're seeing that and we're feeling that impact all across the world. And some of these are mildly inconvenient things. And some of these are really crippling businesses. So in that regard, I feel like the talent challenge of this really tips the scale in that favor. The issue of retention, people have been unhappy at work <laughs> and looking to leave. Like that's not new. That's not like a new phenomenon. Not us though. Not us. Not us. No. no I, love not us. <laughs> I love my job. But engagement numbers have always been low. And and that, had, that was occurring even before the pandemic. And I don't see figures where the pandemic has radically changed that in the same way that it's changed the challenges with hiring. So depending on the industry and the geography of where you are, like the job market is somewhat easier for people to make exits. But I still believe the hiring challenges are more difficult um, than, than gives just like that edge over retention. It's so, right. John, as I turn it over to you for, for your answer here, I think I'm with Sarah. I'm a 60-40 from hiring into retention. Um, and But I do believe retention will, I think, creep up as the months go on because I think people are going to be just even more unhappy because they're doing extra work because the hiring has been such an issue. So what do you think, John? Yeah, and this, this the, the shape of these curves are going to change over time. But I agree with both of you. I think there's a lot of reasons why some that I didn't hear are we've got a large amount of retirements and that's not a retention issue. That's just the life cycle of an employee. And so as we've got the silver tsunami or the heavy amounts of retirements taking place, we need to fill more jobs. Um, and we've got high growth in a range of different sectors, sectors where I play a lot. Like I do a lot of work in manufacturing and supply chain as an example. And those are places where you have massive amounts of growth. And so people retire, we've got high growth, and people are either going to work 70 or 80 hours a week, and we need to hire people. And uh, the hiring's tricky. We've got, and I won't mention names, but a chicken processor offering $8,000 signing bonuses to hourly employees in Iowa. Um, we've got $5,000 signing bonuses at an ice cream manufacturer in upstate New York. And these things are commonplace. And so as we look at the, the hiring story, um, yeah, it's, it's labor participation is the problem. We haven't properly cracked the code on that. And the retention, when you get them in there, the turnover is no worse than it was before. And remember, we, we had a hiring ret retaining problem before the pandemic, right? This isn't new, um, but I'm with you on the 60-40. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it is a similar problem. It's just that there's a catalyst that's moving it along and there are different problems, which I think is what the two of you were also saying. There's different issues that are coming about now yep. um, that are pertaining to that. So, you know, that, that was real, that was my first high level question, but, you know, I really want to start with, with that question. And then as we, as we go in, John, I want to, it's, it's really been incredible watching all of this play out really in real time. I mean, the last 18 months. So there's, there's so many impacts and so many considerations. So, What's exactly, what's going on? Um, we're going to spend the rest of our time talking, but I really want you to kind of spend a few minutes, about 10, five to 10 minutes, just talking about where the economy is today from an overview. I've heard you give this before, and I think it's super impactful for people to understand it's not one thing, right? Yep. And, and by the way, and thank you. And what I, before you hang up, because you already think you know what the answer is, there isn't one answer. And 
people often think it's the government checks, especially the extra $300 a week in the federal pandemic money that was, was going out. And uh, the UKG, through hundreds of millions of data points, has figured that that absolutely was not something that moved the needle. And we'll, we'll hit on that. So if you're thinking it's about the government checks, that's a factor. The pandemic checks on the federal level were not a factor, but the bigger checks are one of probably a hundred different things that that can move the needle. But it's it's certainly not the only thing, and there's a lot of others. So I'm gonna I'm gonna run through some slides quickly. Um, and again, you two feel free to interrupt me. I'm a good interrupter. You two need to be good interrupters. Uh, <laughs> so um, first is you, you you did it right off the bat. Thanks, Chris. What did you say? <laughs> Um, the first thing is when you look at labor um, participation rates, and by the way, I think UKG has even a better chart than um, the Fed on this, the Federal Reserve. Uh, but we saw, you know, if you look in, in the UKG charts, if we, if we look at February 2020 as 100, right, the benchmark before the pandemic hit by sector, we saw many sectors go to about 60 to 70 percent participation or punches in and out, people showing up for work compared to February. And there was a quick correction. Um, in April, May, and June, getting us back to about 80, 85% of where we were. Problem is that we haven't moved the needle much since then. We haven't gone above a 90% getting back to 100. Demand's there, right? We need the people, but they're not coming back to work. And so here's the, the Fed's version of that chart, but um, a lot of things have happened. So, you know, workers talk about quitting as part of the great resignations, great resignation, but employees aren't buying it. I love that the career website Monster found that 95% of workers are currently considering changing jobs. That's because they're on the monster.com website, knucklehead. Like, if you're taking a survey on a website where people go to look to change their job, that's the result you're going to get. So there's a lot of numbers out there that aren't accurate, in my opinion. Microsoft, though, found that 41% of the global workforce is weighing leaving um, their current employer to go to another employer, um, not you know leaving and di disappearing from the workforce, but they're looking at, at jumping to something else. And I think that kind of disruption is critical to understand. So folks, I, I'll stop just for a second for, for Chris and Sarah. Do you, do you folks see anything around this disruption or people saying, I've got a different point of view now and maybe I'm gonna go somewhere else? For sure, yeah, for sure. It, the pandemic has definitely caused some people to evaluate kind of the, the trajectory of their lives in a way that they weren't doing two years ago. And so that definitely is going to be having some impact for sure. And by the way, many people weren't evaluating at all. They were saying like, this is what you do. You do this, then this, then yep. this, then you retire, and then you go and do whatever. But not anymore. Chris, sorry, go ahead. And I think a lot of people were comfortable where they were prior to the pandemic. They were just mm -hmm. in a uh, I don't want to say a, it's not a rut, but they were just in the consistent of like, hey, I go to this job that I'm at and I don't I don't need like you said, I don't need to evaluate it. Now the pandemic has made us evaluate the time we spend with uh, family, you know, because we couldn't spend time with family at one point. Right. You couldn't go see anyone unless you live with mm -hmm. them. And then if you live with them, you were like, oh, my God, get me out of here. Like, right. <laughs> you know, like Sarah, I've got you know, I've got four kids. So at some point, the kids wanted me to get out of here. Not mm -hmm. them. They wanted me to leave. But I, and, I, and I constantly wonder, is this the grass is always greener phenomenon? And it's been um, accelerated by the pandemic because of this. Dave, Dave Gilbertson said, uh, I just did 400 days of bring your kids to work. I don't ever need to do this again. Never again. <laughs> Never. No. Right, so let's, let's build on a couple of those stats. Um, you know, stra strikes, mass quitting and rage. We talked to workers who are fed up with terrible conditions and are fighting back. But that when we look at the data, it was less and less about the wages and it was more about a work-life balance or as Chris, you say, work-life negotiation. There's never a balance, right? There's always, and you're famous for saying that, but it's, it's the conditions and it's the flexibility and the ability to live a life with work, which by the way, we were all just knew we were supposed to do this thing and then something changed. A couple of things changed. Um, and let's remember back in 2019, 47% of all 18 to 29 year olds we're living at home with at least one parent. 2020, we got that number up to 52, 53. We were bouncing around. Um, big numbers. More than half, though, in 2020, 18 to 29-year-olds. And we said, do they really need to go work night shift at the warehouse or at the factory or at the hospital if they're living at home? You know, mom makes a pretty good chicken parm. The Wi-Fi is free. You know, 
borrow the car when I need it. Um, it's, it's not the same story. Now, again, these trends were big before the pandemic. They're even stronger now as these social constructs that have been going on forever have, you know, begin to change. Um, one big one is that the average boomer net worth per household, so whether it's one or two people, is $1.2 million. Now, for some, they say, well, that's not enough money to retire on because, you know, look at the interest from that plus Social Security, you're still not going to be getting a lot of money. Um, but it does make them the wealthiest generation in history. Okay, so this is a big change. Um, by 2030, $68 trillion are going to transfer from these parents to the children. So they see it. They're not having to work two jobs to support mom and dad to pay the mortgage or the rent and do these things. This is a different world they're living in. They can live at home. Um, and again, they don't really need to work right now. Eventually they will, but right now they don't. And that's tricky. So these two are tricky. I'm going to keep going. I know we're going to talk about all this stuff, but we've talked about money. Now let's talk about marriage. Um, we have the lowest marriage rates um, we have in our history. Um, I don't know if people don't believe in marriage anymore. There's still people together and they're having some children, but marriage rates are way down. And, you know, if you're, if you're not married, do you really need to move out of mom and dad's house? <laughs> you can probably stay there, which perpetuates this whole cyclical equation. And then, of course, birth rates. Um, let's talk about reproduction because we've covered marriage. Um, we're going to do religion next. You think it's a joke? We're going to really do religion next. Um, but people are not replacing the population. We're below two children per every two adults. Um, when we were having more than two children, we said, this is so irresponsible for our environment. You know, the environmentalists are saying we're having too many kids. We can't, the earth can't handle all these people. Now we're not having enough to replace the population and people are concerned we don't have the workers to do the jobs. So all of these things, you know, we're wrong on either side for different reasons. And then as I promised church membership, just to cover every sensitive topic out there, um, for the first time since we've measured it, folks that are a member of an organized religion, a church, a synagogue, a mosque, et cetera, um, we're below 50%. We're at 47%. And Sarah, when we go back to social constructs, and I'll call on you for this one, is when you go to church, and my grandfather was a Presbyterian minister, my wife's grandfather was a Baptist minister. They don't even think Presbyterian is like a solid, that's like a junior varsity, right? They're like, come on. Um, but on, in both our families, there's a social construct. You get married, you have, you hopefully get the job, you have kids, um, and you go to church and you talk about your kids and your job, and this is what we do. And as marriage is becoming less and less popular in the United States, these social constructs are fading away. It's not that necessarily people have less faith in God, but they have less um, interest in actually going to a place to follow a particular construct. So Sarah, do you think this is, I mean, this makes me nervous, but not because I think everybody should go to church, but it changes the game a little bit. Yeah, I definitely can see that. I look at it with my own children and with the kind of Gen Z and some of the younger millennials that I work with is that concept of um, organized religion um, and, and the practice um, surrounding that is definitely something that is not as important to them as it was to the Gen, Gen X and boomer generation for sure. And then some of those older, what do they call them now? Geriatric millennials. Um, <laughs> this is the worst name ever, but some so. of the, the, the older earlier in the generation millennials, um, the practices that we have. So I, it's, I can definitely understand how that would then tie into the ways of work because there are much less regimented and routine um, traditional views when you start seeing less you know traditional and I say that in quotations but yeah, sure. families and the structures and the social concepts that go along with all of that when you start to see less of that you can see how that can then trickle into more pushback against what we see as traditional work. Totally. And it's, it's funny because if you, know, you after a church service, you, you, know, you say hi to the pastor on the way out the door and they say, how are things going? And you go, no, it's pretty good. I'm getting, uh, I'm getting a check every week from the government. The Xbox is fired up and um, pounding a couple of six packs. Honestly, things are pretty great. Like that doesn't happen. You don't have those conversations. So no. if you're not going to church and talking to everybody about all of, you know, basically after church is brag time, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody tells each other what's going on in their lives. If that's not happening, you're like, I'm off. 
let's just do whatever. So it yeah. doesn't mean people are going crazy, but it does. It's one of the several things that, around social accountability. I think it's interesting. Chris, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think whether it's right or wrong in, in any of these situations, it does create um, a social culture construct that we're not used to. It's not predictable anymore. We, right. we can't predict that, hey, you're going to follow this quote unquote traditional or linear path that other people have followed. Um, and I think, I think, John, you bring up a great point about the wealth of the boomers. Um, it just it just requires less of those of their children. You don't have to get a job like you. Yeah. It, you have more choices. Like I, I knew that my parents are blue collar. I had to go to work when I I thought when I was 18, it ended up being like 16 and 17. I went and did construction full time. 14 um, over here. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You know, I was in Del- yeah, I was That's working ridiculous. in Delhi. Yeah. I was working in a deli at 14, transitioned to construction at 16, 17, and, and did that for quite a long time because I I just needed to, to make some money. Um, but I can understand why the generation now is like, hey, look, I've got a, I've got free internet at mom and dad's house. I've got, you know, the houses are bigger, you know, so you've got your own room. It's mm-hmm. not like you're sharing That's with safe. your brother. You're, it's not like you're 25 and sharing rooms with your older brother anymore or sister. Um, and so I think that creates a construct that people have more options. Yeah, it's interesting. So I just, I wanted people to think about that. And 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 there's a, a couple of things, again, I wanted to spell the myth around the checks a little bit. Yes, checks do something, but the federal unemployment benefit, the 300 bucks, 26 states ended the federal unemployment benefits early. Now, what's amazing is UKG has hundreds of millions of data points on what happened to workforce activity by industry to say, did we see movement by state even, okay? And um, what did we find out? Um, We found out, and and Dave Gilbertson, one of your your coworkers, Chris at UKG, who I speak with all the time and is spectacular, um, he said, hey, I I did the analysis. I've got the workforce activity reports and all the punch data, and there was no additional improvements in the states um, that ended the federal unemployment benefits early. As a matter of fact, they lagged the 24 states um, that kept them until September 6th. So they actually did less well. Now, there's a lot of reasons why they did less well. One is that they had already made so many improvements because they were the, the, the most improved through the pandemic recovery. Um, so they had less room to go. Um, but I believe the 24 states, and don't quote me on this, although this is, you know, we're doing this live, um, but it's, I think that the, the 24 states had a 4.1% increase in workforce activity um, during the same month where the 26 states had a 2.1 or 2.2 percent increase, so a significant difference in recovery. Um, so clearly, it was sort of counterintuitive um, for everybody else. But I just, do you folks want to jump on that, Siri? Do you have an opinion on this? The checks, because there's, you know, it's almost like a political divide. It is ex- that particular piece of the conversation for me has been exhausting because I. Nobody is balling out of control and living some kind of like super high life off of their unemployment benefits and whatever, you know, government supplements that they may have got in addition to that. Will it meet some basic needs? Yes. Um, Will it allow them some breathing room? Sure. But it's not going to replace full-time income for the vast majority of people. The reality is that people want to work. They want to work in a place that gives them dignity. They want to work in a place that gives, that treats them fairly. And what the pandemic I believe has shown us is that when everything first started and and we saw furloughs and layoffs just kind of happening in mass at the very beginning of the pandemic, I think people kind of awaken to this idea of like, I'm not as secure in my employment as I thought. And if my employer isn't going to show me that loyalty, then I'm not going to give it to them either. And I feel like that's really the awakening and the shift that we're seeing. And then people got thrust into a financial situation where they had to truly make a dollar out of 15 cents piecing together their unemployment with whatever government subsidy that they had. And 
whatever living situation between their parents or their, their roommate or their spouse or whatever it was to figure it out, to cut things where it needed to be cut and to make it work. And once they were able to do that, I think the mentality shifted to just say, okay, I don't have to put up with a workplace that isn't going to pay me fairly, treat me with dignity, give me opportunity. I have figured out how to figure it out. And so now I'm not going to go back. And I think that's why we're seeing, that's, that's where the checks played the part. It wasn't so much in giving people comfort because I feel like we, we think that it gave people comfort. It gave people resolve and grit more than anything else to say, I'm going, I can figure this out. I can make it work with less than what I thought I could. And I would rather do that than go back to working in an environment that's not going to honor my dignity. And you know what's interesting about that, Sarah, is even, even the, the companies with a bad culture, but that were keenly interested in profits and performance said, you know, we don't care about our people, but we need to behave a certain way if we're going to drive mm -hmm. profitability and performance. And it has to do with belonging to DNI. And so we have a guy that used to work at MasterCard named Sean Miles who came over to us, he was the leader at, at MasterCard in this category. And he said, what leaders don't understand is that this is not charity work, diversity, equity, inclusion, community connection. This is not charity. Yes. This is driving performance and the ability to hire and retain the best employees in the area um, and, and to drive revenue by yes. actually connecting with your community in an effective way. But bad leaders don't understand that. They think they're, they're writing a, a charity check and that's not at all what's happening. When this is done right, this is really about capitalism and driving performance for some people. It actually works mm -hmm. both ways. You can be great with your mm -hmm. culture and drive performance. Yeah, and, and, yeah. It, and it definitely works. You're right on, John, is that if you implement belonging, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, that it can work and it, and it can build the bottom line. I yep. do think we are, uh, from a cultural perspective, Sarah, I agree with you that um, the, the checks did what they needed to do. So people didn't have to put up with maybe their employer that they didn't like. I, I think we're actually seeing a round two for those who are left at their companies and the companies are trying to figure out this return to office here in the, in the Americas, North America and around the world. I'm seeing more folks considering leaving companies they've been with for decades and have loved their company because some companies are actually reverting uh, back to where they were prior to the pandemic or actually taking it a step further. Um, I have a few instances where I know folks who work for large um, <clears throat> companies, pharmaceuticals in, in different industries, and they were allowed to work from home every Friday prior to the pandemic. During the pandemic, they were working from home the whole time. Mm -hmm. Now that they're going back to work, some of these organizations are saying, you cannot work from home at all, no matter what. Even if you were allowed prior, that day is gone. Five days a week, you're in. And so I'm hearing from those people going, I am out. I Yeah, I've been, they've been there for 15, 20 years. And dedicated to the place. Parachute. Now they're actively, actively looking. And, and to your thoughts, Sarah, about like the, the safety of our, our companies prior to the pandemic, I come from the from higher education, from academia, and that's exactly how that industry operates, is that people go and work there because it is secure. And we saw mm -hmm. during the pandemic, they couldn't even be as secure as they used to be. And folks were being laid off, and now I'm seeing them hire again, but more folks want to leave that industry because the lack of safety and security they saw prior to the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I am, I'm surrounded by private equity le leaders and hedge fund leaders um, where I work in New York City and the, the community that I live in. And their complaints over and over again are, we hired all the killers, the alphas, you know, the, all the, the Ivy League killers, um, the best 21-year-olds in the country. Um, and they came through the pandemic and they're saying, you know, we need you to come back to the office three days a week. And they're like, I don't think so. <laughs> so dude, the killers, the, the highest performing aggressive maniacs that are going to do whatever it takes are now like, I like working in my sweatpants and I do an hour and a half workout at noon. Um, and this isn't going to work for me. And I'm talking about the major banks, major private equity, major HUD fund, mm -hmm. fund. And these folks are finding other employment. They're taking pay cuts, 
for flexibility. I just, I thought it would never happen. And that's my own narrow-minded view of the world and in the salaried world, but it's happening. Yeah. Yeah. And, and John, that, that kind of gets us to, I, I mean, that's a perfect segue where I want to go with this conversation for the folks. I want to talk a little bit about employee burnout right now. And then, and then later we're, we're going to go into mental health, wellness, and, and, and that part of the conversation. But so we've been living through and working through a global pandemic for the last year. We mentioned it, we have everyone sick of it, right? For, for the last year and a half. And it seems like we're having a decent stretch um, to go ahead of us, right? This, this idea that it's absolutely exhausting for employees. We're expecting them to act like they're back to normal and without any time to rest. So without any time to recover even. So Sarah, is this a huge mistake? Are we, you know, businesses, what they're doing today to help employees get R&R, &R, are they helping them to get what they need, their rest and relaxation, um, even though everyone is still short staffed? What, what should we be doing when we consider employee burnout? Oh, so yes, this is a huge mistake. Our bodies and minds. So this is where physiologically, we have to start to look at people more holistically. We have been in a hyper state of awareness for over a year now. And that impacts everything within our bodies. We, all of our, our fight or flight mechanisms worldwide are activated because there is this thing out there that if you leave your home, you could catch and potentially die or pass to someone in your household and they could you know, become severely sick and die as well. And the stress of living with that, the stress of watching people that you know, your coworkers, your neighbors, your, um, your friends and family, watching those individuals go through that. Some, a lot of us work in industries where we have seen that people that we work with pass away where, and or lost family members ourselves. We are enduring grief on top of stress, on top of major shifts in the way that we live and work during this time period. And our mental health is stretched as thin as I think it has ever been in its lifetime. And as we are hopefully on the downside of this pandemic, what we need to be thinking about is what happens when we when we when it stops and when we get back to quote unquote normal. First of all, normal is not coming back. Like let's yeah. talk. Let's pause and and say it was that. Normal for a before. <laughs> it was not normal before. It wasn't normal. It wasn't sustainable when we started, and and the pandemic really blew the doors off of this idea that the way that we were working previously was even recommended, you know, or sustainable. And so what we're seeing is people just completely burning out and breaking down under the weight of trying to maintain any semblance of normalcy in these times. And what they need from their workplaces is more rest and downtime. Um, and employers have to be aware of that. You think about when you are in a situation where your adrenaline's really pumping, where, where you're running really hard, where you're on super high alert. What happens to you when that event is over? It's the whoosh, yep. right? It's, it's the I'm tired. It's the I've got to rest. I've got to recover we are going to go through a worldwide whoosh. <laughs> like that is what is about to happen to us when we finally come out on the other side of this thing and everyone is just going to finally like feel the exhaustion that we've all been putting off and trying to continue to like run and maintain normalcy during this time. And if we want to survive this, then we have to find ways now while we're in the midst of this to slow things down. Like this to me is the opportunity for organizations to really look at, okay, instead of having 10 projects, let's just try, let's have five, you know, like let's try to just get five things done 
in order to slow that pace, to prepare ourselves for the natural, like coming down of all of that adrenaline and stress and so forth that we've been enduring during these pandemic times. Yeah, this, this is this is why I get so upset when people are talking about the return their return to work strategy, and I start to yell. We've never stopped working during the pandemic. In fact, exactly. we worked more. That's why it's return to office. And John, we mentioned um, you mentioned it uh, about people biking or working out during their lunch because they like to do that at home. They like to work in their sweatpants. Sarah just mentioned the your typical traditional work schedule, like five five days a week, forty hours. John, if Organizations are still thinking in this mode of five days, 40 hours a week. Uh Why is it so hard to break away for that mindset? Uh, Because not everyone's there, but there are a lot of organizations still there. First of all, I was on 142 airplanes in the last 12 months, and I can tell you it's it's been insane. Um, I'll I'll answer your question two ways. One is um, when it's the way we've always done it, people don't like change. And so some good things that came out of the pandemic is people were forced to change in some ways in good ways because they were able to innovate and do things they never thought possible. Some, to Sarah's point, are not sustainable. (laughs) You know, and it's great that we got out more than we ever did. Um, But some things, they they learned to adapt. Um, We have a client where 30% of the population flew back to their home country and they had to learn how to make a particular kind of potato chip with 30% less employees. And they figured it out. Everybody got a promotion, everybody got a raise, and nobody's working any harder they just re-engineered the process, um, which was really interesting. Um, but the, 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 the challenge I, I see around this, this 40 hour concept and 40 became 50, became 60, became 70 for a lot of our potential businesses like food processors and toilet paper makers and people, I work with a lot of these kinds of companies. Um, I have seven clients right now that are firing customers. And they're not firing them because they're bad customers. They're firing them because they have to protect their employees. And so they've said, listen, I'm firing you. Call me in a year. But right now, my employees will not work more than 55 hours a week. Um, And because we need that to protect them, um, I can't have you as a customer anymore. Um, We're so sorry. Uh, We can't find the workforce. So that's happening a lot right now. And it's one of those tipping points. Never fire a customer. Just work the employees harder. Not anymore. Um, now you fire bad customers before the pandemic, sure, but now we have people firing good customers. And I think that's an interesting story around the 40 hours. First, we need alternative shift schedules because people are thinking differently. We can look at you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 hour shifts. We can look at different day on day off patterns. That's a key differentiator and advantage, but we also need to fire customers when we get to a point where we cannot make it work and we're damaging the workforce. Because if, if you don't, they're gonna leave anyway. Then we can talk about retention. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's one thing I also want to make sure that we know, because one of the things like I have high anxiety. And so very early on, and one of the things that comforts me in my anxiety is information. So very early on in the pandemic, I immediately started researching what happened in the 1920s, like how we've done this before. Some of it's got, I know we've made advancements, but some of this has got to be similar so that I can look back and say, oh, okay, this is what happened around this mark in the 1920s. We're here now, so this is normal and I'm okay, right? What's interesting and, and one of the things I don't think we're talking enough about that John's comment just reminded me is that it was the 1920s pandemic that launched us into the labor movements of the 1930s that launched us into massive legislation changes that came out of the night, like the things that set minimum wage and OSHA and all of those kind of governmental governing bodies over how it is that we work and how it is that we compensate people. And I think it's important to remind organizations in this time that if we don't want more governmental interference, doing the things that John just talked about by saying to clients, listen, we are not going to work our people to to the point that they break down. So we are going to have to step away from your business in order to make sure that we take care of them. Those are the things that organizations are going to have to do now if we don't want to see 
governmental interference with how it is that labor has to be managed going forward because we're already so, so starting I to see even those the bad rumblings. companies have to do it right even the yeah. bad companies have to do it yeah we're already starting to see those rumblings we're hearing about the paid you know we're seeing it at the state levels with paid sick leave with with pushes towards higher minimum wage with pushes towards changing the the us from the 40 hour work week we've had this 40 hour this 40 hour work week came out of the 1920s pandemic what are we going to push are we going to force the government to push us into something else or are we as organizations going to stand up for our workforces do right by them so that we can hire the talent that we want and we can retain the people that we want to retain rather than letting another revolution happen that then forces us into governmental compliance instead of just doing the right thing. Yeah, and I think, you know, and, and it give, brings up a good point because John uh, talks a lot about the scheduling and, and I know it's a lot about where your presence is required type of employees. What do you, Sarah, what do you think about the traditional office model. I mean, if we're talking about scheduling, John, you know, John mentioned that quite a bit. What does the traditional office-based, you know, workplace model? What does that look like? How do we, uh, in like ninety seconds, how would we shift that? What does that look like? Should we be considering something different? I think organizations who are reluctant to shift away from the traditional workplace model are having either issues with lack of structure in terms of how the roles are structured such that employees are producing in a way that can be easily measured, right? Like either you did the work or you didn't do the work. So there's a lack of structure there that makes your impact obvious in a way that that performance management is easier when I don't have eyes on you. Um, Or the other piece is that there's really a lack of trust between management and their employee base about their level of engagement and productivity or both, like both things can exist. And so when organizations are afraid to move away from that traditional workplace modeling to embrace more hybrid work, more remote work, work from anywhere, work from home, so forth, it typically stems from that lack of structure where it's like, I don't know what they're doing. Well, that's a problem. That's your problem. Like that's not the, the person's problem. Yeah, it's it's you should know what they're doing because you've created a job role for them that is defined, that has metrics, that has key performance indicators. Like if you haven't done those things, then that's your fault if you don't know what that person is doing. But then the other thing is that I know what they're supposed to be doing, but I don't trust them to get it done if I can't see and direct and and have all those sorts of things. And that's a secondary issue that's probably still your problem but you know that's where organizations definitely have pushback on that not wanting to work in traditional offices and then the other piece to John's point earlier the 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 manufacturing industries the essential jobs the frontline jobs those jobs can't be done remotely 90% you know of the time and so then that becomes an issue of how do we schedule more creatively, what is the way that we take on work to make sure that we're still profitable, but still caring about the health and welfare, you know, of our workforce, and how do we need to remodel our staffing, so that we're staffed appropriately to produce at the levels that we want to, but still give people the space that they need for rest and recovery. And Sarah, before Chris says it, I want to say it because I like getting credit from Aaron Ain on any possible topic I can, and he's going to say, I'm going to get him first. Aaron wrote an, wrote an entire chapter of his book entitled Trust. Mm-hmm. The chapter is called Trust. And he said, why is it that we spend so much time interviewing and going through the process of hiring somebody and that we hire them, we go, okay, now you've got to earn my trust. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If, you, if, if I hired you, I should trust you to start with. And if I don't, I shouldn't yep. have hired you. And yep. trust is a critical piece of culture. And you touched on it, you didn't do more than touch on it. You really nailed it, Sarah. And I think it's a super critical piece. We can't let them work from home because I, I don't want to say it out loud, but we don't trust these people. You know, we, it's crazy. They shouldn't be working with you then. Yeah. Right. Because I'm trust sorry. Them again, trust them again and again. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, that that's a, that's another great segue that the well being of our employees into the mental health that we said we would just, that we would discuss for a few minutes. Um, 
And it's a topic that I think right now is super important. It, you know, it's, it's in the headlines right now. And, and, you know, we, you go right from burnout to mental health issues. I mean, they logically, they, they go hand in hand right there. And so there's a lot of stressors involved with mental health, whether uh, you need, you have needs or whether you're supporting someone or employees. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Sarah, while we're preparing for this discussion, you said something that really stuck with me and you said we need to have. Let me get this right. You said that we need to be having more conversations about the impact of death on mm -hmm. working age people in the workplace. And in the U.S., this is the first time in 50 years where many of us had teammates, colleagues, other professional acquaintances actually pass away unexpectedly, mm -hmm. um, whether you're old or young in the workforce, yeah. you know, no matter how long you've been there. And, and it happened somewhat on a regular basis over the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing are we doing a good job addressing this in the workplace? Overall, no. Um, the The last numbers that I looked at were in August, and the that twenty five to thirty percent of people in the U.S. who died from COVID are working age. And then when you look at that number worldwide, you get it closer to like 40 percent. And so we keep talking about talent shortage we short on talent because people have died. Like that's yeah, a real, shortage. yeah, we have a human shortage. Like there, that's a real thing. And then on top of that, you have family members who are grieving, who now may not be able to work in the same capacity that they did before because their, their partner, their support system has been altered. And so they can't work in the way that they did before. And then you have coworkers who are traumatized and grieving and not able to produce in the same ways that they did before because they're in this environment with this person that they've lost and that's triggering and difficult for them. Mm -hmm. And these are real issues that we're, we're not talking about enough and we're not doing um, enough to support employees through. The way that we handle bereavement in the workplace has always been um, not good. You know, three days off or, or in some places a week off, like, oh, all right, you know, my, my husband passed away, my father passed away, whoever. And a week later, I'm all good to come back and produce. That's not the way that grief works. And so it, and when you lose Sarah, someone, I think it's three days off, but one of the days has to be the funeral day. The like, funeral. let's make sure we yeah. lock it into a little box and bring yeah. a note. Bring it yeah, and, and it and it has to be like this very narrow definition of what family entails that doesn't necessarily include, right. you know, extended family and lifelong friends and and all the and the family that you make in a lot of cases that are just as important to you as the people that you're related to biologically. So it, it has never worked and, right. and it definitely is not working for us now when we are losing so many people. And you, what, what the interesting phenomenon, and I'm experiencing it myself, I've lost 17 people that I know and love during the course of this pandemic. And I am in different stages of grief with different people all at the same time, still trying to work, still trying to raise my children and, and give them some semblancy of quote unquote normal, still having to produce, still having to do all of those things. And it's unfathomable to me that my employer would not be, would not recognize that this is a reality for me that this is going to be hard, whether I admit it or not, and wouldn't have a plan in place to make sure that I am okay, that I am supported, and that I have the, the time off and flexibility that I need to be able to work through these multiple cycles of grief that I'm in at the same time. And employers are dropping the ball on this because oh. talking about the death and the things surrounding the pandemic is scary. We feel like it feeds into, if it, it backs away from this normalcy that we wanna achieve. And so we're just not doing it. And, and that definitely has to change. It feels, it feels cold. 
right? Yeah, and it's, it it's, is. It's, it's, it's not as cold, it of course, as Ed Rooney from Ferris Bueller's Day Off that asked him to produce the body, bring yeah. the body yeah. down to the school. But it's not so far away from that, it's is it? It's not that far away, yeah. no. no. No, John, let me, let me set this up because I have a question for you. And this and Sarah's points lead right into this because at the Workforce that we talk a lot about compassion and empathetic leadership. In fact, you and I have been together in person over the last few months speaking on this exact to- or on different topics, but this always comes up. If we're talking about compassion and empathetic leadership, right? And we've seen a lot of good examples of, it, of that during the pandemic. We've also seen a lot of poor examples of it. How can we convince more leaders that, it's, that, that there's value in that type of an approach? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate that we have to do the math, but I believe we have to do the math, um, which is terrible. It speaks to culture, but to include everybody under the tent about empathy and including the workforce and really creating moments that matter, um, we've got to do the math around what are the costs of not doing that. And unfortunately, I, you too may yell at me for this, but I think people are more motivated by fear than hope. Hope is lovely, but fear is the great motivator. And if we can tell them what happens when you don't do those things and put dollars attached to each one of those topics, um, we really move the needle. And you know, turnover is incredibly expensive. Um, discretionary effort is something that you get when you're empathetic with employees. And discretionary effort is critical. It's the difference between a good company and a great company, right? Employees can can push the button, do the job, follow the textbook of what they're supposed to be doing. But if they go above and beyond, that's the differentiating factor in in most high-performing companies, the employees that provide discretionary effort. And when that goes away, so do the profits. And we have a lot of examples of that with clients that have called us in to say, you got to fix this for us. Yeah. And you know, I want to. I know we're coming to an end of of, of our webinar uh, today and our talk. So I really want to end with some closing recommendations from the two of you, from well, from the three of us, I think. And I'll, I'll put some of mine in there. So as we're running out of time, what you know, we've hit on some of really big topics, right? You know, uh, burnout, mental health, the, the changing in the economy. But there are a lot of things that HR leaders, operations managers, that you know, they can actually start doing as soon as tomorrow to help ease the pinch their organization is feeling right now. So Sarah, can you give us like two to three recommendations that you would share with our listeners and our watchers that they can act on at this moment ASAP? Yeah, I think the first and biggest for me is to stop looking to go back to normal and to start looking forward to what the new normal is and embrace the pandemic and the aftermath of it as an opportunity for your business to innovate. Knowing that we've lost workforce, knowing that what the workforce requires of organizations now is going to be different, how do you improve your processes, improve your people operations? How do you improve to be a better business on the other side of this? So that's the first thing. The second is, to be keenly aware and on the lookout of that fatigue and that burnout, that that whoosh that I talked about earlier. Um, because when that happens, um, people, you know, the absenteeism, the the breakdowns, the health issues, like all of the things that are going to come out of that um, are going to be very real and present. And so you as an organization have to be looking to get out ahead of it, but, but know that it's coming and know that you have to have a plan for how it is that you're going to deal with that wellness, um, particularly mental wellness and financial wellness Mm -hmm. right now are going to be so major. And so those are the places that you can really look to get some wins and some opportunities to put plans together to support your employees in overcoming that fatigue and that burnout. And then um, within that, you know, seeking those opportunities to talk about mental health, normalizing the process of, of speaking about those things and normalizing the process of slowing down, recognizing that the way that we were working prior to the pandemic and the, even the way that we've been working during the pandemic are not sustainable or good ways to for us to do business long-term and making the pivot to do better. Well, thank you so much. John, what are your three recommendations or actions that people can take right now to help, you know, support retention, hiring their organization? 
Yeah, so I, I, I combine two things and it's really one point, which is, and it's harsh, but I want people to listen to me when I say this, do not be intellectually and emotionally lazy. This is the story. It's, it's not one thing. And everything Sarah's talked about paints a broad, rich color picture of everything that's going on. She didn't say like, if you do this one thing, it's all fixed, we all get to go home. Everybody gets a scoop of ice cream and go to sleep. It doesn't work that way. And so if you're gonna be lazy about this process and say, it's because of the checks or it's because people didn't care, it's, it, it's because only about childcare or it's only about this, you're gonna miss the point of the entire exercise. Right. Same on the emotional side. Right. You have to actually engage your workforce in a real and meaningful way. It's not enough to say we care about you and we do great communication meetings where we talk at you for an hour once a month. That doesn't work. Right. We cannot be emotionally or intellectually lazy. And that's really I mean, everything else falls under that umbrella for me. So I'm going to leave it at that. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think if I were if I were going to give a, a few recommendations, I would kind of piggyback off the two of you and say, if you're trying to build a great culture, John knows I speak about this a lot, the moments that matter, the employee journey, the employee experience. Think about what experiences your employees have with you. Their points on a journey, everything from clocking in and out to taking vacation to getting paid. You can make those positive moments that matter. So that's one. Look at your employee's journey and try and to- By the way, Chris, aren't those things that everybody can do? This doesn't everybody. require your PhD to do these things. <laughs> Everybody right? can do it. Everybody do can do that. To do it. <laughs> you, yeah, but you can create moments that matter. Everybody can. So simple. And, yep. and so then that leads me down the road of managers. If you're a manager or a leader out there, get to know your employees better. What the pandemic has shown mm -hmm. us is we can see into their lives, right? If this were during the full-fledged pandemic, I'd have three or four kids running around. My God, I hope they would have clothes on, <laughs> but, you know, during a presentation, but they, they'd be just coming in and out. You got to see into my life. You can see some people are still working from their kitchen table, right? You can, and I used to, I get a lot of questions from folks, uh, coaching clients and folks who want me to coach them and say, how do I create a better relationship with my employees during the pandemic? I go, did you have a good one before the pandemic? Because it's a lot yeah. harder to create a good, a good relationship I, virtually. I'm, I'm in my kid's room now, by the way. <laughs> That's his Naruto I picture. love it. <laughs> nice. So, so if you're a manager, try to develop those, that trust with your employees and get to know them better because managers are the linchpin to the culture. They are, that's of awesome. Your company. So, that's so awesome. I would leave people with, with those two things and they're very actionable. I mean, if you don't know when your employees' birthdays are, their, their, um, their work anniversary, I mean, these are basic things you should know as a mm -hmm. manager and, and recognize them for the good work they've been doing and learn about their families if they're willing mm -hmm. to share. So that that's my recommendation. As, as we say goodbye for today, um, our time is up, sadly. Uh, we could, the three of us could do this for hours, I'm sure. Hours, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we will be in person uh, in the next month or two, so that'd be fun. Uh, before we go, Sarah and then John, where can our listeners, watchers, where can they find you on social media? How can they connect with you, Sarah? Um, I am at the Buzz on HR on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, Sarah K. Morgan on LinkedIn. And my website is buzzerooneyllc.com. And that will link you to all that other stuff. And you can also sign up for my monthly newsletter there. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. John, what about you? So I am john.phrase, F-R-E-H-S-E, at ankara.com, A-N-K-U-R-A.com. And if you want to follow my journey on the road on my 142 airplanes every year, uh, I'm Woody Loves Travel. I'm John Wood Phrase. And so Woody Loves Travel is my handle on Instagram. And it's because I hate travel. Um, I record all the terrible things that happen to me. Stolen armrests, you know, all those critical things um, along the way. Yeah, that's bad, Sarah. It is. Oh, that's great. But thanks for including me, both of you. And I, I love doing this. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. It is my yeah, pleasure. If anyone wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, it's Chris M. Mullen. So there's two M's in there. Uh, no spaces. And you can, hey, look, all three of us are on the Workforce Institute. So check out the workforceinstitute.org where you can find a lot about what John writes about, Sarah writes about, um, and myself as well. So with that, thank you, Sarah, John, and for everyone joining us today, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Have a good day. Bye.